Unspoiled Network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, episode 64, the last one, titled fittingly, Journey's End. In this episode, I think that I said about how many like loose ends there were to tie up in the last episode, and I talked a lot about how I wanted Havoc to be okay, but I don't think I talked at all about reparations for the Ishvalans, and that's on me. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. I am Natasha. Thank you so much to Max for commissioning this entire series. It has been a heck of a ride. And uh, this is the kind of thing that I feel like I am interested in reading ancillary material just out of curiosity. Um, now that I am spoiled on this and Apparently, it follows the manga pretty closely, but there are some differences that I think might be interesting. I also want to mention that because this is the last episode of the show, I went and read the wiki for this because I was just like, now at this point, I can. So I went and read the wiki for this episode, and um, it mentioned some specific differences to the manga that I thought were interesting as well. So I am going to reference those. And this is the only time I will ever do that because otherwise I wasn't allowed. So I found this last episode to be pretty satisfying. You guys know that I've been a little bit hard on the past few because everything was at such a breakneck pace that I felt like it, a lot of it wasn't really being explained super well. And I don't think that it's like a huge flaw because probably people are going to be mainlining this and they are going to be a lot of them, people who have read the manga. So they know, but just as somebody who is taking it as slow as I am and trying to understand, uh, I did feel somewhat lost this episode though. There is none of that because we're just wrapping and seeing where people go. And I feel good about it. You know, I feel like, Mostly everybody winds up pretty much where I wanted them to. Um, so I'm going to start from the beginning here because when things first start off, we have the scene with um, Dr. Knox and he is coming in to see Roy and he's sort of wondering like out in the hall, I think it's Ross that meets him and he says something about like, is he taking it hard, the loss of his sight. And then when he comes in here, he has this moment of shock as he's seeing that uh, this dude is keeping himself very busy. He is not sitting there feeling sorry for himself or just sort of lamenting his loss. He is out here taking action to accomplish the goal that he had originally set out to do. And I... <laughs> be more is quoting him with it reeks of optimism in here. I fucking cackled at that line. I really did. Be I was so glad they, because everybody is just, it's so upbeat and I appreciated them acknowledging within the script that like, maybe we just need to sort of tone it down a drop or at least acknowledge it. Um, but I found this, <laughs> this was something that happened to me. You guys know that like once I split up with my husband and I took over the show completely by myself, that was when I really had to start like putting the pedal down and going hard to try and make this my actual living. And I was, I, for a little while before I moved down here to Texas, I was staying with my mom and her husband in their apartment. And I was so busy. I had gotten a full-time job and I was doing these recordings. And I remember hearing my uh, stepdad say to my mom, and this was actually before I had gotten the job, 
saying to my mom as I ran up the stairs going, oh, my God, I'm late for my recording. He just goes, well, she's definitely keeping herself busy. Nobody can say she's just laying around. (laughs) And honestly, I was sort of glad to have the podcast to like throw myself into so that I wasn't just sitting around thinking about my marriage ending and everything changing. I had something to really keep me occupied. It helps, you know, there's a, there's ways that you can abuse that and overdo it, but I think it can really help. And what I found interesting here. So in this scene, he is getting a quiz, um, a, basically like a series of flashcard questions about Ishfall because he wants to repair the relationship with them. And what I thought was sort of uh, surprising here was when I went to the wiki for this episode, what it turns out to be is that Roy didn't come up with this. Roy was sitting in the midst of like the battlefield, super despairing and depressed and it was Dr. Marco who comes up with him, who comes up to him with the uh, Philosopher's Stone and makes a deal saying you can have this to fix your eyesight if you agree to begin working on fixing shit with Ishval and making things right with them. And I think it's very interesting that they decided to change that for the show and make it that he is already intending to do that and they are just generously offering him the philosopher's stone to heal his eyes as a completely separate transaction i kind of prefer the way that it went in the manga because that feels more honest to me in some ways and i can see that maybe if they want to make roy more heroic Having him be the one to say, no, we really do need to like improve our relationship with this country that we completely dicked over. I mean, that makes total sense. But I just think it's very surprising to find out that in the original material, Roy had to be uh, bribed feels like a strong word. But Roy had to be, first of all, just pulled out of his funk because apparently he wasn't this upbeat, busy little bee that we see. He was struggling when they found him and that he had to sort of be like given this mission and reminded of like what he had set out to do. So not to like, I have no problem with this scene as written, but it is just a really striking tonal difference to me to find out what it was originally like. B more says it's nicer as a karmic reward rather than something transactional, whether it's more realistic or not hard to say, but Roy had clearly been working on these plans for a while based on Reza's chat with Ed about war criminals all the way back. So I found it believable. Yeah, I agree. Um, when I say that the other way felt more honest, I just mean sort of like real world honest in that what he went through, I mean, like the battle that they just went through is it was really something. And the idea that he has immediately bounced back and is like full speed ahead. It does feel less real world believable. However, the tone of this final episode is mostly all about moving forward and the optimism of the future that's directly mentioned and to have him who was the one that sort of he was the the fulcrum around which a lot of this all rotated to have him be the one that's despairing and has to be reminded of what he was going to do that doesn't really suit the vibe that the episode was going for. And I I will say in light of the way he acted in the rest of the series, despite the fact that I have not really liked him, I don't, I buy this, you know, I think that this makes total sense. So anyway, um, but all that to say that when they offer him healing, he's like, yeah, 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 that's great. But also 
I need you to fix somebody else first. And he has them heal havoc. And I was so relieved, y'all. Y'all, you know how it is. I tend to do this. Anything I'm covering, there's one particular, like, very silly subplot that winds up sort of not mattering that I get kind of obsessed with. And I don't know why that happens, but it just is what it is. And Havoc was the thing for me. The way things went with him and his, like, the gravity of his injury and how abrupt it was and how much I was enjoying him up to the moment that it happened. All of that combined to just make me go, no, 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 no. What? What did you do to him? So I am very relieved that he winds up being healed. And apparently, like, it doesn't use up the Philosopher's Stone because we know that when Dr. Marco was in that other town, he was able to heal a lot of illnesses and injuries using one stone and it didn't like use it up so it hadn't really occurred to me that they would be able to do both i'm thinking there's one stone between them what are they gonna they have to pick but they don't that's not really how that works um so yeah i was very happy about this moment and the only thing that i will say i was a bit bummed out by is that nothing seems to come of him and Hawkeye. And I say that I'm bummed out by this with an asterisk because I, you guys know, I'm a big fan of let's just have these two actually care about each other, but it be a platonic thing. Even though everybody acts like it can't possibly be, let's let it be. And I think we need more of that men and women who are just honestly care about each other and are friends but are not sexually interested at all that said i really would prefer if we're getting a ship that works out it being roy and hawkeye than ed and winry ed and winry is fine it's not horrible but it doesn't feel earned to me like there's no chemistry between the two of them in my eyes I felt more chemistry between her and fucking Al as you guys know and the the connection between them isn't like it just doesn't feel strong enough because they both seem so young to me still. And Ed is just so... He still feels like kind of immature by the end of this. Everybody else seems to have grown quite a bit. And Ed just never really feels like he has for me. So it, it felt like they put the two of them together because they needed to propagate this family. And the fact that like they continue to grow and multiply and have this sort of like, you know, this warm, loving picture at the end with two, uh, like two children. And that's meant to be the happy ending. And I get that as those things go. But I am not personally somebody who needs that because I don't want children and I don't consider having children and being married to be an automatic happy ending. If anything, I feel like that's a real question. And for him and Winry, they just never felt like the two of them meshed. They were always kind of sniping at each other. And while their values did tend to line up, I didn't see a whole lot of like respect. And with Roy and Hawkeye, these two are, they have each other's backs in a way that as a grown up, I understand now that's what matters. These two know each other so well, they clearly really respect one another and they will give each other real talk when they need to and be like straight with each other. And there is just so much more chemistry between those two. And you guys know that when it seemed like we were having a bit of a hint that Hawkeye was into him, I was sort of like, oh, girl, you can do better. And I stand by that. She can do better. 
But if we're going to have anybody get together, I really wanted it to be those two. And I'm a little bit sad that it looks like that didn't happen based on the way that we see things go. And it's possible it does eventually. But Winry and Ed, I think what it comes down to for me is I respect that Ed is a good person doing his best. But I never really grew to like Ed. So Winry, who I do really enjoy and who is very talented and fun, being with him just feels kind of like a a much stronger girl you could do better than it is with Hawkeye. Now, you know, I understand that because of the age thing, they didn't want to have her hook up with Alphonse and that's fine. But Alphonse is much more husband material than Ed is. He just is. He's just, he just is. So I will continue to ship them in my head and kind of pretend the fact that her and Ed got together didn't happen. Um, Damien says, uh, Hiromu Arakawa has said that if it weren't for anti-fraternization laws in the military, Roy and Riza totally would have hooked up. Oh, I didn't really think about the law thing. I guess I'm assuming that if they got together, that they would like leave the military. And I don't know how that would even work because he is going to become Fuhrer somehow. We don't actually see any of that. That was the thing that I found the most interesting in this episode. He isn't like healed and doesn't gain power by the end of the series. We see him in the like credits after and clearly he is Fuhrer, but Grumman, is that his name? He is the one that is actually in power by the time the episode ends. And there isn't any like definite information about how Roy is planning to take his place. And I'm very curious because it's, I I don't really know how that would work. Like they don't do elections for a Fuhrer, right? I just really, what I want is for them to change the name of their ruler from Fuhrer to literally anything else, (laughs) because that just has such a connotation. Um, But I did think it was really surprising that they decide to like, not have him take down this like, old man who was very ready to sacrifice a bunch of people so that he could stay in his spot and instead sort of just let him ride it out. I was it very, it took me very much off guard and I'm not mad about it or anything. I, I, I wasn't like so attached to the concept of Roy becoming Fuhrer. I really wasn't. It's more about how everything has felt like it's leading up to that point. And then by the end of the series, we don't even really get it, which is kind of interesting and cool. Like I'm, I actually kind of like that, but I am curious. Um, Tony says in the manga photo at the end, shows Roy as a general, not Fuhrer yet. Oh, okay. So I thought that that was like him. Okay. I got you. So I misunderstood that image. Um, So Damien says he never reaches that way in the series. Uh, Damien, by reaches that way, do you mean that Roy didn't want to become Fuhrer in the series? Or that he doesn't actually, like, get there? Or is the TV show showing him becoming Fuhrer and the manga doesn't? I'm just trying to make sure that I understand what all everybody is conveying here. Um... Anyway, okay, okay. So then we go to Scar and he is with General Armstrong and Miles. And uh, General Armstrong is like, look, straight up, we just kept you alive because we really needed to know about how Alka history works. However, now that shit has kind of worked out, there is a project that we could loop you in on that I think you would find rewarding. And it turns out that Miles is going to be sort of spearheading this effort with preserving the Ishvalan traditions and history. And he wants, uh, he wants Scar to help him. And it takes a little bit more convincing than I was expecting. I sort of thought that 
Scar would be like 100%. But he is thinking to himself, is this why I was saved from death? And I was thinking to myself, that seemed like what you wanted from the beginning, Scar. Why are you even like, you know what I mean? But anyway, he says, I'll follow wherever you see fit and agrees. So she takes off. And as she's walking out, she says, oh, Mustang, I wish you could, I could see your face when you find out Scar's still alive. And she says it to herself in this way, like, he's going to be so mad. And I really wonder, will he? I felt like he had started to, like, Roy had started to understand Scar's value and change of heart in this. And I, like, I, it was weird because she says this in the setup, but then we don't see that moment either, which I really thought that's why it was being set up. Um, and as she's leaving, she asks Scar what's your real name? And Scar says, I've died twice. I'm no longer the person that I used to be either of those times. So I don't have a name. I don't need a name. Call me whatever. And she says, okay, Ishvalan, and she leaves. Man, pick a name. What are you doing? Like, you're not prince stop it just pick something it's fine i get not wanting to have the name scar after that being like the notorious dude who is out here murdering state alchemists and i'm not mad at you for that but just being like i don't have a name anymore you don't need to be fucking dramatic man just <laughs> i'm saying that that is literally scar's entire deal is that he's kind of a drama queen and he's a drama queen in that like really understated I'm actually being stoic way but he still is so it just it struck me really funny that he has this whole moment where he's like I don't have a name anymore that's gonna be really annoying sir they can't just call you Ishvalan like do something um let's see Damien says oh wait there's some from B more up here uh, if Roy became Fuhrer by being the last man standing after a partially successful coup, it'd weigh him down in the long run with his goals. Having Grumman serve as a placeholder while Roy builds the reputation he needs made a lot of sense. Recall Roy wanted to resolve things with Ishval and also return power to the parliament. I'd forgotten about that whole thing. Yeah. Uh, major changes like that take a lot of reputation, so to speak. Um, Damien's quoting something. Although Roy has become Fuhrer as, at, as of the end of the series, she states he'll eventually become the leader of a mistress and that if she were to make any extra chapter about Full Metal Alchemist in the future, it would be about that event. She also stated she has decided Roy would not yet become Fuhrer because he's still too young, unquote, which is from an interview. Okay, cool. Um, so that's the the end of things with Scar. And then we go to Ed and Al and they are going home. They're going to be seeing Winry for the first time. Um, and I guess that, you know, they haven't like gotten in touch with her and let her know that Al has gotten his body back because she seems pretty shocked when she sees him. But before then he's sort of struggling with uh, walking because he had a lot of atrophy in his muscles. So, he's using a crutch and he's going pretty slowly and he tells Ed, you can go on without me and I'll catch up. And I couldn't help but laugh at the idea. Like, can you imagine if Ed was just like, all right, see you there. And just took off and walked out ahead of his brother. Like what a dick move. Oh my God. So of course he says, no, we left together. We're coming home together. And they talk a little bit here about the events of the previous day and we get the scene where um ling <laughs> there's a moment where ling is standing he's talking to mei chang and he says something about how um you really wanted this but there's only one and i'm the one who got it and like 
you know that he's going to do something to help her. But in the moment, it just felt really like mean spirited. Like he was just going, ha ha, I have it. You don't. And I was just like, man, you need to get to the point real quick because you are watching this little girl almost burst into tears in front of your face, sir. And I am judging you for it. So, yeah, eventually he's like, I'm going to be emperor, but I'm prom I promise that I will take care of your people. I'll protect everyone. And that's when she says everyone that's just greedy, which felt very contrived. But they really wanted to, like, get that word in there, which doesn't like it doesn't really feel natural in the moment. And I thought that we really got the point about how greed was sort of meshing well with Ling's personality already. But it's fine. And he says, I guess he rubbed off on me. Um, but they're not like I was sort of expecting that maybe they would go with Ed and Al home, but they have Fu and they want to bury him. So they want to go home and bury him in his homeland, understandably. And uh, he like, I think that they come visit. I think we see them like in the end credits that they come by later on. But uh yeah, this this bit is just him like sort of taunting her with this. I was like, sir. Uh, B. Moore says, to be fair, their families are such rivals that Mei Chang and Lan Fan try to kill each other on sight. So a bit of teasing was pretty mild. That's true. I've completely forgotten about that aspect of it because like really from that first moment, I don't really see them together often like you know what i mean they're the the rivalry between them that's kind of the only episode that we really see it too much so it's very easy to like forget about that um but the boys are talking about that and then there's like a moment where al is sort of going so what's the deal with you and winry and Ed says, me and Winry, how about you and May? And I was glad that it seems Al is super not interested. Like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, super don't want that. Absolutely, 100% do not want. Unsubscribe. So, but yeah, it's just meant to sort of like bounce the attention back off of each other. Um, and then we have... Winry seeing them and the way that this is done I thought was like really sweet because they have the the dog barking outside and you hear Ed's voice saying Den stop that tickles and I love this because the the fact that he's saying it tickles it wouldn't in his steel body so she knows before she even opens the door and sees them from that hint that he is back in his body. And I thought that that was like kind of cute. I don't know. I just liked this moment of her standing there with her hand on the door and not opening it as she, as it just sort of registers for her what that really means. And then she opens the door and we have a moment of focusing on the photos of all of them that are out in the hallway and she just bursts into tears and tackles the two of them. I love that in every photo, Ed looks like the biggest spoiled brat. There is like barely a smile out of him in a single one of these. But this is a rewarding moment with the two of them. So three of them, I guess I should say. And then we jump ahead two years. And... Ed is working on the roof, but he doesn't have alchemy anymore. So he is just smashing his poor little thumb with a hammer. And I had forgot about that sacrifice. And I really did appreciate it being mentioned because, man, it must be such an adjustment. Like, can you imagine? I <laughs> have you guys ever had your phone die and you aren't anywhere near a place to plug it in or anything. And yet you keep pulling your phone out 
and tapping on it, trying to see what time it is or see if you got a text or you were about to check the weather and you remember, oh, right, it's dead and not 45 seconds later, find yourself pulling your phone out again. I am really bad about that. Like when my phone dies, I would rather have just like forgotten it because actually physically still having it is so confusing for my poor brain that it's not working. But my point here is just like how used to a certain reflexive response you get as the solution for fixing a problem. And for me, you know, it's like, oh, who's the guy who's, who wrote that or starred in that? Or, uh, you know, well, is it going to rain tomorrow? And I just pull my phone out and not having that to fall back on every time I have any question. I genuinely don't know how we lived. Guys, what did we do back in the day when somebody was like, who was the star of that? Who wrote that? And we just go, don't know. And that would be it. And we would just move on and we would not know. And now we can just find out immediately in a second. And it's just how did we do anything without it? And I feel like poor Ed losing his alchemy, like, that is just such a big deal. I don't know, man. I feel like he could have sacrificed his arm. I understand wanting it back and everything, but like, if you could do alchemy and you had to give up your arm, but you could do fucking alchemy, would you give up your arm? Especially considering the, the kinds of like automail that they've got going on in this universe and how well it works. I don't know, man. I feel like I might give up my arm again. I don't know if uh, Truth would have taken it as an, a sacrifice. Maybe Truth is like, mm, double jeopardy, man. You already sacrificed your arm. We can't take it again. Maybe you could sacrifice his other arm. But regardless, uh, the level of sacrifice is, is quite intense. And it's admirable. And I feel for him a great deal. Uh, let's see. B. Moore says, not contrived as much as a cultural difference. I've noticed a slightly different perception in Japan that overambition is legitimately considered a form of greed. Oh, not contrived because I said, may, I'm sorry, I'm getting to your comment so far after I finished talking about that, that I completely lost track of what was contrived. Um, but Mei Chang saying that, I got you. Uh, even wanting to do a bunch of things for other people, if it's beyond your ability, is seen as wanting things unrealistically. That's fair. Okay. Um, then the overambition is legitimately considered a form of greed. Like, I also consider overambition a form of greed. But in that moment, it, it just felt weird because of it being like, I'll protect all of you. It just, I it is him being ambitious, but I'm used to ambition being self-serving. And that's just so, I... I'm really working on dealing with like my baggage surrounding certain words because I am an ambitious person. And granted, sure, a lot of that is just about personal. Like I would like to have more money. I would like to be able to afford medicine. Um, but ambition can also just be like, I want to achieve a lot. And yet that word tends to have sort of negative connotations, just like the word greed does. And I can accept that. It's just in the context of the scene, it just felt off. Um, let's see. People dancing in a circle around a fire calling for rain makes a lot more sense when your phone is dead. <laughs> uh, right. That's the weird part. Altruistic overambition is also looked upon poorly past a certain point. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess that makes sense. Um, so he's working on the roof and I really do enjoy that Ed comes up or Al comes up to visit and is just like, hey, man, how are you doing? And Ed says something about how like, oh, Winry works me like a slave, yada, yada, yada. And Al interrupts him and is like, she says she's making tea to go with the apple pie she's baking. <laughs> and I did like that moment of just like, man, she's not just down there chilling. She's doing shit like this is your job and she has her job. Just. Be cool about it. Um, and for the record, 
Ed does try and uses alchemy, despite having sacrificed it and knowing it isn't going to work. He still does like clap his hands together and then slam them onto the roof in an attempt, which is the reaching for your phone and pulling it out of your pocket and looking at it and then going right and putting it away. So I just appreciated that a lot. So (laughs) this is when Al says, I've been thinking about something lately. And Ed says, me too. And I bet we're thinking the same thing. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Genuinely not a clue. What it turns out to be is that they are both going to like travel and and meet the people that have helped them through everything that just happened. But it was, it didn't even like occur to me. I guess the reason for that personally was just that they have lived through such upheaval that I thought, aren't you just going to want to chill? But it's been two years and I just didn't quite feel that it had been two years within the episode because it's a quick jump and they have so much time. So for me, I was just like, man, you guys like just got done. You're already ready to pack up and like begin traveling again. But it's been a while. So it does make sense. Just within the scene, I just genuinely was like, you're both thinking, what is it? I thought it was going to be something that like, maybe they mentioned as like a dream vacation or something, you know, earlier in the the series. But it cuts from them like reflecting on how they're both probably thinking the same thing to Grumman, who is in the midst of talking to Fuhrer Bradley's wife. And... She asks how it's been going. He says it's exhausting. New problem every day. They're sending me to an early grave, but I've got help. And this thing, this conversation pretty much confirms the fact that she knows Bradley was a homunculus. It is still unclear to me how much she knew while they were together. I think she didn't know anything. And after all this went down, they told her. But I'm not really sure. They don't really say. Um, And all of a sudden, she's talking to him and she says something about how he sounds like her husband. And we see this kid walk up. And here's Pride. What is going on with the nipple on his forehead? Why is this? I'm. I. It's supposed to be like the mark of a homunculus, apparently. I don't recall. Like, they're not actually part of the the. What's the word I want? The like set of vices anymore and the mark that they used to have wouldn't really apply but I guess it's just supposed to indicate he isn't fully human however it didn't need to look so much like a nipple it just does there is nothing else that I can see when I look at him we couldn't have done something else like truly I hated this for him so awkward oh my god so the one thing that we get to sort of confirm for us that he is not a raging fucking maniac is that this little bird is injured and he is frantic to get this bird some help which honestly is so relatable There is nothing like the anxiety of realizing that an animal is like hurting and you need to do something and you don't know what to do because you want you're watching it in pain and you can't explain to it. Don't worry, we're going to get help. It's not going to understand. Oh, I hate that feeling. So his whole like expression here, he's just got a very different look than Salim did in terms of the expression in his eyes and Obviously, this motivation of helping this bird is genuine. It doesn't feel like a put on. This kid bears no resemblance to the old pride 
beyond looking like him um beyond beyond having a complete resemblance to him in other words uh damien says wild fun fact that comes from a guidebook Grumman is Hawkeye's maternal grandfather. Oh, so when he told Roy that Roy should marry his granddaughter, that was another shipping joke. Oh, that's fun. Um, and Grumman, for his part, is watching Salim trot off and is like, huh, yeah, he seems different. He's growing up to be like kind of a nice kid. And then says to her, you better watch out though. Like keep an eye on him and, and we're going to keep an eye on him for a bit longer because you know, who knows? And she essentially says, I'm going to ensure that there is never anything to worry about. And I wanted to be like, I hope that you can, because I genuinely have no idea how much control she has over that. But it's an interesting moment because he's looking at this kid who is a homunculus and is just kind of like, I guess we just have a homunculus like living amongst us now. I wonder what that's going to look like in the future. And all I could think was, I hope it doesn't look like anything because apparently you've got to like sacrifice a person to make one is the impression I've gotten. And I really don't feel like I want that. I... Also, can't help but wonder if Selene, like, were to go to a public school, which he never would, obviously. But if he were to go to a public school, it would be rough for this kid. Nipplehead aside, just being a homunculus is already, like, you were part of the group that tried to break our entire city. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. It would be so bad for him. And then add the nipple on top of it? Disaster. This poor kid. It could never work. He's got to be kept in private school for his own safety. So um, the, let's see, uh, Damien says, all of this takes place two years later, something that was indicated with Japanese text and wasn't translated. Oh, it was translated. It was translated. I saw that it was two years later. I mentioned that earlier. Be more says amongst us. I hate you. Stop it. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so then we go to Al visiting with Hugh's wife and daughter. And uh, this was kind of a neat moment. He's talking to them about equivalent exchange. And they're, you know, bringing it up in response to him saying that they want to go around and thank everybody. And he says, we're trying to come up with something new where if you get 10, you give back all of that and a bit of yourself. So it's more like you're giving back 11. And that way you're always like kind of contributing more. And I don't have any idea how that works. I, I think it's just meant to be like a metaphorical thing here. But I liked that idea overall. It's basically like, you know, we're returning with interest. We're repaying with interest. And uh, it's just really weird to hear Al's voice coming out of this, like, young man's body. Because he looks like he's probably 15 here. Older. He looks older, but I don't think he's supposed to be that much older than that. Um, and they still have, like, the voice actress, I think, doing his voice. And they may at this point have a male voice actor, but they had the voice actress who had been doing his voice earlier in the episode for sure. And it was just a really weird vibe, you know? Um, but yeah, this, uh, he says, we're still haunted by the memory of a little girl that we once knew. We weren't able to save her and we will never forget that. And he says this and it's this like kind of haunting moment. Where he's really like, God, that was awful. And we, we couldn't do anything. And we just think about it. And then it cuts to the Gaimira absolutely stuffing their faces. It, it is such an abrupt tonal shift. And I was just like, okay, show. 
just give him a second. Let that moment breathe a little bit. But they just smash cut to these two with like flecks of food and crumbs flying all over the place. And I was just like, all right, I guess we're doing this now. Um, it's Gerso and Zampano. I can never remember their names. And it turns out that Al is planning to head over to Shing and they want to come with him, which uh, is unexpected. And he doesn't really seem to want them to come, which I thought was surprising. Like, I don't know. There's just I would think that he would want the company. I thought that he like got along with these guys pretty well. And yet. He seems sort of like, so do you guys still want to come with me? There's an expression on his face like he doesn't want them to. I don't know. Um, And Ed, for his part, is going to the West. So he is going to try and find other kinds of alchemy that they may do in other places. And uh, that way they can combine the things that they learn and try and like do some good for the world which i think is an interesting idea the the concept of yet another type of alchemy being out there i also the one thing that they don't address this episode that i do wish they had is you know how they were talking about um a couple episodes ago that all of the like ton the the pipes below the city that were full of souls basically there were giant philosopher's stone full of pipes that those were like dampening what they could do with their alchemy. There isn't a mention about alchemy being way more effective or people being surprised by how much it does now that that barrier has been removed. And that is something that I'm really, really curious about because I, evidently it was meant to sort of tamp it down a little bit. And I'm, I wonder what, they are capable of now that they maybe didn't think was possible before, but it turns out it's simply because they were being reined in, you know? Um, But anyway, these two dudes say good things are bound to happen if we stick with you. And that's based on our animal instincts. And they get this fucking like animation of them, flipping in midair and then standing up and their animals like rearing behind them making their animal sounds and it is really quite a lot it was hilarious it was truly like and i'm watching this and this is the moment where like owen came home for a break from work and he walks in and it's just like this roaring and this like pig squeal sound with these two men yelling and he was like what is happening and I was like it's gonna take too long don't worry about it (laughs) um so then we go to uh Winry and she is saying goodbye to Ed as he is getting onto the train to leave and she's trying to give him instructions on how to take care of his auto mail and he looks weirdly miserable and when he's she's trying to talk to him, he's just like, yeah, uh-huh, whatever, sure, yeah. And she gets up to leave and he looks at her and his face is all sweaty because he's trying to work up the courage to say something. But this is sort of what I mean. This scene with him like not listening and just giving her one word answers, this is really what I feel their relationship has been like mostly. It feels like most of the time they are together is her getting infuriated because she's trying to help and him not appreciating it and being very demanding and ruining her work sometimes or not listening to her and then coming running back being like, but wait, help, help again. And for this scene to go the way that it does right before he basically like asks her to marry him in the weird fucking way that he does. It just girl. No, this is so many red flags at once here. This kid needs to grow up a lot. Don't commit yourself to this kid right now. It's not going to work. It's bad. It's bad. He's bad right now. He maybe he will be better one day 
at the moment, nah. Keep him on the shelf. He needs to continue to ripen. Um, so, yeah, she is, she watches him get on the train and he sets one foot on. And when she says, call me to make an appointment if you need it, he stops and says an appointment and then turns around and looks at her. And it's a weird moment where I guess it's supposed to be an appointment feels so impersonal that he's kind of startled at the idea that everything they've been through, he's going to have to make an appointment. Is that what this is? He just has such a reaction to that word. And that's the word that sort of makes him stop and turn. And I guess that's probably what's happening there. But he turns around, he stares at her. He's not talking. She finally is just like, dude, will you fucking just spit it out? And he says, I'll give half of my life to you if you give half of yours to me. And he like yells it at her with his face bright red as he's like pointing a finger in her face like he's like. <laughs> it's just so bad. And I know that's supposed to be part of the joke, but like. Because of how unlikable I have found him overall, this moment was really just, oh my God, Ed, get it together, you know? So she uh, stands there for a minute and then it like sinks in what he's saying and her mouth falls open and she just kind of drops and goes, oh, my God, are you really trying to do this, like, talking like it's alchemy? And then says the whole equivalent exchange thing is just pointless. And Ed yells, what did you say? He's getting defensive of alchemy in this moment. That is not the thing, Ed. And she says, it's nonsense. How about I just give you my whole life? And then there's a moment of both of them sort of stopping and staring. And then she begins to get red as she realizes what she said and goes, wait, 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 maybe not all of it. Hold on. How much? 50%? That doesn't feel like quite enough. 80%? 85%? 85% feels good. And he is just in the background, like, cracking up as she tries to make sense of what marriage means. Which, good luck, Winry, because who knows? Um, but, yeah, the two of them just really just don't either of you get married yet. Y'all need a lot more time. It's fine. You're very adorable, but please, but they won't, they are going to do it. And he grabs her and hugs her and says, I'll miss you for now. And they only hug. He proposed. There's no kiss. Is that weird? I felt like that was weird. It's such a chaste goodbye. He's literally proposing. What is going on? Like, I didn't, uh, I just, I have an expectation when you are setting up a couple of characters over the course of like an entire series to be into each other. And the very final episode, they seem to be finally getting together. And you don't even have, it's not even like a short peck it's nothing they just hug i just straight up do not ship them at all i don't this was just so awkward and weird um damien says japan is very weird with physical affection i guess just come on so anyway he rides away on the train and we have her uh, standing there as this woman comes up to her and asks, why can't those boys just settle down? And Winry says, it's good for them to keep moving. Men who sit around doing nothing are boring. 
And then we get Ed and he is on the train. And this is like the final bit is him thinking about how any lesson that you learn in life requires pain and some kind of sacrifice. And there's just kind of no way around it, which I do agree with. And then if you are able to endure it, the last lines are, if you're able to endure it, you are going to be able to overcome any obstacle, a heart made full metal, which uh, I do think is meant to be inspiring, but a full metal heart sounds very cold and not like what you want. It actually sounds like the name of a villain in a way, but the full metal heart, you know, um, but I get what they were going for. And yeah, it's extremely true. Nothing, you don't learn anything without like losing something or fucking up or, you know, it's the kind of thing where people talk about like having life with no regrets. If you don't have any regrets in your life, then you are ruining something for someone out there. You should have some regrets. That's the way that you know you're growing is you look back and go, oh, my God, I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. You know, like regrets are part of it. And people act like they're if you have them, it's just you wishing you hadn't gone through a hard time. And that's not what it means necessarily. Regrets are just the side effect of growth and that they are deserve respect in my opinion so yeah that's the end of the episode and then we get the actual credits um so and we also get here i thought this was interesting the translation of the theme song at the end which there's never been a translation that i can remember of the words for the theme song um and i kind of like want to go and read the whole like set of lyrics because the bits that I was getting, cause I was torn between reading the subtitle and looking at the images. Um, it sounded very poetic, but yeah, so we get Ling as emperor. He looks so intense. Oh my God. We get Yoki and he is dressed like a clown looking extremely unhappy as the other two guy Mira are like yanking on his hair what is happening there? He doesn't seem like he's having a good time. He looks in distress. The other two seem to be having a great time. But I, like, y'all know, Yoki is not my favorite guy or anything. But this didn't look awesome for him. I don't know. Um, And <laughs> then, oh yeah, this is when we get Roy with the mustache. Honestly, I'm certain that people have feelings on the mustache. I do think it makes him look like kind of an asshole. That said, it suits him. <laughs> and I know that that sounds like I'm just saying that because, but I genuinely mean it. Like, Roy is kind of an asshole. And I don't know, man. The mustache just kind of feels appropriate. Like it just, it makes him more who I think he is. You know, it feels like me with having my hair be like magenta and purple. It's not my natural hair, but when I have it like this, I feel more like myself. And I feel like that mustache makes him more who he is. And it's just, I don't love it, but I don't really like Roy. So it kind of works. Hawkeye has cut, a bunch of her hair off, which, you know, I love that look. She looks great with short hair. She definitely should keep it short. I really, really like that. We have a bit with uh, Izumi just looking down at the camera with her fists together, like she's going to crack her knuckles before she beats the shit out of you, um, which I was just kind of like, all right, I guess nothing much has changed with Izumi. <laughs> um, oh, right. And then we get um, Havoc and uh, what's the name of the other guy? And there's a woman in the center who I think is the girl that was friends with Hawkeye that turned up very recently. I don't think we had met her before, but she turns up and is like joking around with Hawkeye when they're out having drinks, I think, because she's like trying to date. But it looks like they are in the brothel bar that Roy's foster mother 
was that the relationship there that she used to own? Um, and she's got like the, like similar jewelry on and everything with the fur collar. It just like looks like she's really going to be quite at home here. I am enjoying the whole idea of what could go down at this establishment. Like they could have a side show and I would watch it because I, I genuinely, that sounds like a good time. This is stuff that makes me think I need to watch P Valley. Um, let's see. Uh, at least I've never found anyone who likes this as Damien. And yeah, it's not manga canon. No idea what the animators were thinking. Maybe it's just supposed to be like an indicator of a lot of time passing. Like they just felt like everybody else is going to look slightly different. And how do you make him look slightly different? But yeah, it's interesting that the manga didn't feel the need to do that. Rebecca and Breda. Okay, cool. Got it. So yeah, I guess they're... Uh, and, and fucking Hawkeye is standing. So... Yay. Um, oh, yeah. And then we've got this one guy whose name I always forget with the shock of like gray hair who's back up in Briggs, I guess. This is one of those dudes that I just uh, like forget he exists. And I kind of feel bad. But there it is. And then we get the uh, last shot where the gang is all together. And they are, there's even some people here. Let's see. We've got the dude who was Winry's mentor who made the auto mail. I can't remember his name. And there's a dark skinned girl. I think she was supposed to be the other person from that same town. That was like a pickpocket. Is that that girl? I'm trying to recall where she's from. We hadn't seen them in a while. Um, Let's see. Damien says, fun fact, the manga shows Havoc still recovering, whereas the anime shows him fully recovered. Okay. Fallman. Fallman. That's right. Fucking Fallman. And then the very last shot is Ed with his suitcase over his shoulder and he's like smiling. And it's honestly one of the only times I've seen like a real big genuine smile like that from Ed. And I kind of like that as like the last shot because he hasn't been, you know, the whole thing with all the photos in the house was that he isn't smiling in any of them. And the way he's looking at you, it feels like this is a photo somebody took, like he's looking at a person who has a camera. So my head cannon is like, this is the first photo anybody took where he's smiling. And I think that's a good ending. So yeah, so that's it. Wild. Um, and I'm using my, my second monitor here, guys. I feel like it's a real moment of just growth in every direction. <laughs> um, all right. Is, does anybody have like anything? I know I'm over time already, but just real quick. I don't know if anybody had anything specific that they wanted to mention or ask. Um, but I thought I would throw it out there. Probably it's already come up if there was something. But yeah, I uh, do you guys know if she is planning to write anything further in this universe. I'm, uh, you know, I'm assuming there is a lot of fanfic out there, but it's, and it, there is so much potential still for this universe because of how many characters were involved and the way that they all kind of go their separate ways. It just feels like, Sometimes when somebody's like, oh, I'm going to continue on writing in that world, you're like, "Ugh, give it up. It ended great. That's a perfect stopping point. Don't mess with it. You're just going to like try and retcon weird shit and make things up. And this is a, a universe where I'm like, now you could write a lot more about this place. Like there is so much going on. And especially since Ed is heading into a whole area of the fucking planet that they haven't explored yet. There's a ton where we would experience all brand new shit. And I'm not even that interested in that part. I'm much more interested in like hanging out with the people that we've gotten to know in their weird new lives. So, um, Tony says there's a bonus chapter. Oh shit. Um, Damien says, Oh yeah, that bonus chapter, they made that into an OVA. Didn't they? I don't know what that means. Uh, Tony says they get Al's armor shipped back and they melt it down to make auto mail parts. Oh, that's fun. Uh, B more says link for the voice actor bloopers. If you want to watch them on your own time, seven minutes of fun with a few real gems. B more. If you wouldn't mind sharing that in the uh, discord, 
And that way I can access it without having to come back into this chat. I definitely would enjoy watching that, I think, though. Um, and yeah, I get to go into the, like, uh, spoiler Discord now. So, original video animation. Gotcha. Basically one shots. Okay, cool. All this slang. All this terminology that I don't know. Um, wow, guys. This is just... It just feels like... I think the reason that this ending feels so much more significant than a, a lot of stuff I've finished ending is because it's the first completed anime I've ever covered. So it's just a totally different genre than anything else. And like I'm covering one piece, but it's not wrapped and it will never be wrapped from what I understand, which is fine. <laughs> but uh, it's just like kind of the closure of my first real complete anime experience and it just feels very significant i think you know um but yeah thank you max for making this happen i really do appreciate it and anybody out there who's listening if you have something that you would like me to cover i'm going to be having openings coming up for especially pre-bookings because it's a lot easier for me to know that something is going to be completed so anything that people can pre-book gets priority but I'm also going to start circulating the poll for things that people are interested in, like group funding. And the thing about that and the reason that it doesn't get as high priority as a pre-book is people will, with very good intentions, say they will help support something and they will commission an episode here and there. And then they can't or they don't. So sometimes it just falls off, even though people mean well. Um, but I just wanted to put that out there. Because coming up soon, I'm going to be booking into the new year. It's going to be 20 fucking 23, kids. Da damn. Um, Tony says, the satisfaction you get to finishing an anime is similar to finishing a full book series. Yeah, that, that feels true for me. B. Moore says, spoiler, it's all downhill from here. Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood tends to rank among top anime of all time. I kind of had an impression already. So I don't think I'll be like too heartbroken about it um i mean and you know like one piece is it's just its own thing the thing that i always hear about is uh my hero academia is that the name of it that and there's some other like something titan i can't remember the name of the other one and the titan one i have a couple friends who are like very into but those are the only ones I really know by name. Oh, and of course, like, um, <laughs> there's Dragon Ball, which we will not get into because it just feels crazy from what I little I've seen of it. And uh, and there's the one other series, Attack on Titan. That's what it is, Damien. Thank you. Oh, and Cowboy Bebop. Yeah, that's one that um, Owen had been wanting to watch. And I have never seen it. I know that they made that like not well reviewed live action, um, which genuinely why? Like, why though? You know? Um, but yeah, so all I'm saying is that there are a few that are sort of like on my radar vaguely, but I have never seen anything. The only other anime that I have covered were the two movies that Candace commissioned. Um, the first one, your name and the second one, I can never remember the name of it, but, uh, yeah, otherwise haven't watched any. So except for like the first two episodes, I think of, um, oh my God, I can't remember. It was an insane show that Brendan way back when wanted to cover with me. And we watched the first two episodes and they were so off the wall for somebody who had never watched anime. I was at sea completely lost and we wound up basically just dropping it because i it was so clear that i had no points of reference to like get what was happening and it's supposedly something that was really hard to get even if you do have familiarity with the genre so we just wound up completely dropping that one um but fully coolie that's the one first two episodes of fully coolie i have seen 
Uh, don't remember anything at this point, but I do remember at the time being like, what the fuck is this? And I, oh, oh, Damien says, I hope it wasn't FLCL. It was, it was though. Um, yeah, it was quite something. <laughs> Uh, all right. All right. I'm way over time. So I do have to wrap. Um, thank you guys again so much for hanging out with me and giving me info and whatnot. Appreciate you all a lot. And until next time. Toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.